Dear Dhamma friends, today also we are going to start our day's question and answer session. As usual, we'll start with the written questions and uh, allow the balance of the time for the open discussion. Bhante, uh, there are meditation related uh, written questions as well as general questions. I will start with the meditation related questions yes. first. Yes, please. The first question. When I'm doing walking meditation, I notice that as I'm placing down one foot, I am lifting the other foot at the same time. Do I focus on both feet together or switch awareness between them? Uh, it is uh, just leave it for the mind. At the beginning, it is touching one thing at a time and that uh, be mindful. And once, uh, when and where the situation become familiar, you try to see uh, corresponding other activities also and don't try to exercise your mind. Just let it to reveal as it is so that mind will understand uh, uh, side by side view and the one after the other view. So that is the way the mindfulness is diversifying, mindfulness is spreading and becoming skillful. So whatever may be the prominent thing, uh, you have to you have to follow. So even though you start with one single thing, you may understand correspondently uh, the correlated things are happening everywhere. Slowly, whenever the mind becomes familiarized, it spreads. So it is a good sign that nothing to worry about. Let the mind to lead it and don't suppress it. Don't try to f attend, focus your attention to one particular side. Let it happen in a natural way. The next question is, during sitting meditation, my primary objective has been on the breath. My focus point keeps changing at each meditation session. For example, from the base of the nose to the left nostril to the middle of the chest. Should I stick to one focus point always or go with the most prominent point at each session? Uh, when you are observing the breath, uh, of course the touching point is one dimension, one aspect of the meditation and there are two more if I am to introduce, one thing is, you know your mind is with the breath, not with the sound, not with the thought, not with the pain, or not with anything. That is one aspect. The other thing is the touching point. It may be on tip of your nose or top of your upper lip or at the bend inside or in the chest or in the abdomen. That's also changing. And the other aspect is, when the in-breath is happening, totally out-breath is out. When the out-breath is happening, 100% in-breath is out. So you can discreetly understand in-breath versus out-breath. Uh, that is also changing. So that means at least three aspects are there. All the things are changing. So that is what the Buddha wanted to show. Even though our mind is trying to see object with particular time and space, it is not bounded by time and space. Each and every time you breathe, the touching point is changing. And every, each time you are observing the in-breath and out-breath, characteristics of the in-breath and out-breath changing. Each time you try to be mindful with the breath, sounds happen, thoughts happen, pain happens. It is not your fault. That is what we call the changing nature. So therefore, don't suppress them and don't try to uh, get worried because this is natural. So therefore, whenever it is happening, as far as you know, it is not an imaginary thing. As far as it is not a uh, volitional thing, uh, you have to understand uh, the place, uh, place of the touch. According to the Hindu tradition, the end opening of your nostril is like a rhombus in shape. And each time the gushing air touches one corner, particularly highlighting, that indicates it may be highlight of fire element, earth element, air element or 
uh, water element. Likewise, the touching point also changing within the nostril. So that indicates uh, how do you, how your body is related with the external elements. So therefore, things are changing. Welcome them, but don't try to promote them or don't try to suppress them. And when and where are happening, uh, understand mm, the touching point also changing. The changing nature, understanding of that, or be mindful about that, or to be vigilant about that is a kind of a maturity in your meditation. So therefore, uh, consider this as a good thing and don't get mixed up with that. Let that natural unfolding to take place. Uh, provided it is not a mind made, it is not a hallucination, it is not a dream as far as it is a reality, uh, just let it happen. The next question is, are there best times during a day to meditate? The reason I ask is that I find it hard to maintain mindfulness and patience during afternoon meditation sessions. I give up too easily compared to sessions in the morning or evening. So when you are doing the full-time meditation or residential meditation, then you can try the whole day and some sittings you find very, very boring. Some sittings are very energetic and concentrated and some walking meditation, everything. So within the time, the moods are changing and your likings and dislikes into the sitting and walking changes. So if you are doing maybe one hour a day, very difficult you to have your own first hand experience. So therefore here uh, you understand sometimes it is energetic, sometimes it is boring. But naturally the beginner is happy to have very cheerful, concentrated, calm and collected sittings. But the best of your vipassana, inside meditation happens when you feel bored. So therefore what you recognize as good is good for concentration. But you recognize as bad may be good for vipassana. So it has to always go hand in hand. So it is a, it's a combination of everything. So after long while only, long meditation only you will understand during that boring, monotonous time, you are more closer to understand the truth of suffering. Rather than your, what you so call, concentrated, serene states. So therefore, it depends of, on your maturity, why you are meditating. If you are meditating to understand the, the Four Noble Truths, starting from the truth of suffering, the boring sittings, monotonous sitting and uh, doubtful sittings, uh, fearful sitting, uncertain sitting, sleepy sittings are uh, giving more information. But our mind is very choosy. So that is why it says continue knowing this is good sitting, this bad sitting, but try to maintain the timetable, then only you are going to get the balanced meal or awareness uh, with choicelessness. That is called choiceless awareness. So it is very difficult to expect from a beginner. Beginners always uh, choosy uh, that their choice also often to the concentration, often to the serenity rather than the truth as it is, reality as it is. So uh, if you are continuing, in a regular way, then one day you will hit the target. Otherwise still you take meditation also under the pleasure principle and only you will do pleasurable things, meditation also. So therefore best time for the pleasurable people or seeking pleasure morning hours after the good rest. But much of the insight happens uh, in the afternoon or evening uh, where you have the day's experience un unsorted out questions and uh, exhausted kind of a mind but still you can see if the mindfulness not the concentration if the mindfulness is 
intact, both has to treat equally. That's very difficult to expect. So uh, it's a kind of a trial and error. The next question is, what is the ideal way to establish a daily meditation practice at home? Uh, home, a household, is a kind of a place good for sensuous pleasure rather than meditation. So therefore meditation is known as something called renunciation. Renunciation from what? Renunciation from the household. But still, we are living in such a situation, we have to find a compromise how to start or do appropriate technology, how to do it. So when I was doing, my I had two tasks, difficult thing. One thing is no time. Second thing was I was utterly made up mind, made up my mind not to show others, not to let, to let others know that I am meditating. So under these circumstances, being a young man, it was not difficult. It wasn't easy for me. So the I resorted mostly on the walking meditation rather than sitting. And uh, even then, uh, see a young boy or girl doing walking meditation, not a single individual in the society will understand in the healthy way. Always they misunderstand it. They think something wrong with that guy. Walking up and down, the cross-legged, the hand crossed and all the kind of thing. So it indicates something wrong. So therefore, if you are not in a meditation center, not in a forest or not, in, not amidst other meditators, often you will get misunderstand, uh, specifically if you are a young person. So therefore, you have to be very strategic uh, to find time and uh, so I would recommend, therefore, uh, don't rush to a sitting meditation. Always try walking meditation at least 50% of your time. And once the mind and body mobilized, better to go and sit. And uh, that also, uh, you have to have at least one hour or so to try have this trial each day. But it's very difficult. Best thing is therefore get up early. If you if you get used to uh, get up early, you see all the others are resting. All the others are still in sleep, in a in a uh, urban atmosphere. Usually householders uh, break rest up to the midnight and sleep morning times. So if you are a yogi, best thing is to Go, go to the bed early, get up early, and early morning you find it's a chunk of two hours sometimes uh, you can do as you like. And they are also, who Pandita Sada used to say, after a rest, if you're going to do sitting meditation, you will fall asleep. So therefore start with walking meditation, and then once the body and mind get mobilized and energetic, then only you have to go for sitting. The next question is, what is mindful eating? Uh, so, the Melbourne people, they made a video clip and today I, I requested them and they have prepared some, made some adjustments and amendments and uh, they have seen the clip. I hope it will be helpful to understand because uh, your yeah, sex and eating are the most uh, involved thing in our life. Specifically, when you go to the celibacy, you do away with sexual misconduct, and then you are you will be really, really moved. You will drag into the eating habits. So whenever you are eating, uh, you may lose your control. So therefore, that's a place where you employ mindfulness least. So therefore in the meditation centers like Mahasi, always the teacher has to be there when you are taking the meal. So that is to say, slowly, mindfully and silently, do eat, but 
one thing at a time and that done well. So therefore in the, the mindful eating, it says uh, you are given uh, raisins or something like a date, uh, one each to one individual, first ask you to weigh it and see how much what's its weight and crush little bit and see what is the touch and have a smell and have a taste and uh, and put into the mouth and see the texture so likewise each and everything do it very slowly and then uh, you get enough time your mind has enough time to understand the, its taste, its weight, its appearance, its smell and uh, texture and uh, put it in a completely social way uh, I hope you know about the, the Indian leader, leader who highly respected was Mahatma Gandhi Prime Minister uh, he was not the Prime Minister of course uh, he was the uh, the person who uh, led the propaganda for the independence and he was a very social leader also. He says, drink all the solids and chew all the liquids. So when you are eating uh, solids, chew it up to the liquid level and then drink. When you are drinking solid, uh, juice, milk or something like that, don't keep on gulping. Just keep it in your mouth for each and every mouthful just chew in order to delay it and let that saliva mix up very properly so therefore he used to say drink all the solids and chew all the liquids because once you take an in it is a heavy weight to the stomach if the tylen is not properly mixed with the food because your starch will be completely digested and uh, macerating and the mixture mixing up with the tylen happen only in the mouth. Whenever it go down, it will go to a acid base. Only the mouth is solid, basic. So therefore, when the people eating so quickly, what happens is the, the starchy foods go down immediately. They change the acid base completely. The digestion stops. That's the point where the the diabetes and all the other uh, eating disorders happen. Instead, if you chew any even poisons, it will not become a poison if you chew enough. Whatever the food you like, take little, chew it properly, and then its bad nature, poisonous nature is reduced. But what happens nowadays is, instead, in the junk food, everything fibrous, fibrous part removed, you keep on eating unwanted amounts and uh, not giving enough chances for the mouth uh, and the maceration tie in to happen. So it is somewhat related to in your uh, meditating, eat slowly, eat mindfully and eat silently, that means not talking each other, uh, that means it's a, a not, it, not that it become a, a emotional kind of a thing but you can make it a meditation and otherwise if you are not attentive while eating what happens is the your wrong feeding habits uh, continuity happens ultimately it makes your stomach is very heavy and then uh, body balance digestion goes wrong even the sitting and walking it you find difficult The next question is, can mindfulness stop anger and other upsetting strong emotions? Can you control them with mindfulness? What are the techniques? So each, uh, each day we had the same question. First day, second day, third day. My answer was, not at the beginning. You have to handle materiality, the breath, or the left leg and the right leg, or the rising and falling. From that only, from understand the materiality only, you can see the mechanism of the mind. Once the mind 
is uh, observed through the mindfulness then naturally slowly mind is shifting from materiality to the mentality that's a point where desire hatred um, other mal malicious emotions can happen so therefore at the beginning uh, you may not find much of a addressing to the mental aspects so they are, that is why at, when as far as you are meditating asking you to go to the forest go and sit under a tree or go to a solitude place there where there is no provocations for the uh, anger or any desire once a mindfulness with the body or kaya kaya anupassi understanding the bodily thing then slowly slowly you can go uh, with the beginning of the anger what is the beginning of the desire what is the beginning of the sleepiness you may understand once you understand what is the beginning of the in breath what is the beginning of the out breath what is the beginning of the uh, rising mood what is the beginning of the falling what is the beginning of the left leg what is the leveling of the beginning of the right leg like then this is hopeful definitely uh, when the mindfulness come up uh, passing the materiality when it's reaching the immaterial part these things will happen specifically in the chitta anupassana and in the dhamma anupassana level so therefore um, if you are uh, it is uh, for an example if you are going to give a high protein food for an infant uh, it will poison us the infant's digestive system is not prepared yet so at that time you have to give half boiled foods half digested food <clears throat> when the system become harder then only you can have solid food and protein foods and high protein so therefore meditation also going in a gradual basis so don't expect much of uh, impact or effect on the me mental side uh, for a beginner but definitely it is once uh, advanced when it is going further uh, you can see changes in your likings and dislikings and personalities and the uh, emotional uh, impacts that was the end of the uh, meditation related questions i will now ask general questions yeah uh, the question is mainstream buddhism seems to focus on ceremonies and festivals as a buddhist growing up this gave me the wrong impression of what buddhism really is should buddhist institutions still place such an importance on these ceremonies of course that uh, each and every one understand the religion through this uh, social ceremonies and kind of thing so it is not a negative thing it is good rather than killing stealing and sexual misconduct going to buddhist ceremonies are innocent of course it's a kind of a not efficient use of time and material but if you need if you are sharp enough uh, you can select uh, good against bad that means instead of killing stealing and sexual misconduct religious ceremonies are good so when you go to the good you can see better things but still if you are adhering to the good that is your that nature of accepting good in the face of better that's your mistake system is always giving it is the bad good better and so you have to understand you are already now in good you are not taken to that bad side so it's it's a one one step ahead but now you have to understand you are facing good and the better the so one western put it is in nice way uh, you are not selecting better because of your goodness when you become good it is also bad that means because at the face of better you have to leave the good and go to the better in that sense the human nature or humanity is not even at the montessori level not even at the montessori level they are always Uh, addicted to their goodness so they are at the face of better they never go to better they they are bragging telling i am good 
And they don't know they are losing the chance to be a better. So therefore, the person who has written has to understand it. The system is varietal entertainment. It is your natural selection decides your future. And don't ask anyone about your natural selection. It is your intrinsic human nature. You can understand good and the bad. And when and where you go to the good, always remember there are better ways. And if you are not selecting, don't find fault with the system. You have to find fault with your goodness. Your goodness is your hindrance to become better. The next question is, the image of the Buddha has become a, a cool or a hip thing to have. For example, there are numerous garden statues, ornaments, water features, etc. that you can buy at shops. For some, this is seen as a sign of disrespect. What are your thoughts on this? Not only that, the Buddha statue and human, a naked woman, both of them are advertisements. I find exactly the same. For the advertisement, they are happy with the naked woman, as well as the Buddha. So when you go to the, the go to Sri Lanka in the Vesak season, you can see how many billions of Buddha images are they are printing. We are at the end of it. Go to the dustbin. Where they go to the other dirty things. And they are worrying about printing about the naked woman, but they are not worried about printing too much of Buddha. And uh, if you get emotional with this statue, that means you have not studied the Mahavira and the Buddha, statue is the same. If you go to India, go to Saranath, go to the Saranath uh, Museum, uh, and there you can find, you can't separate the Buddha image and the Maha, Mahavira, Mahavira is the Nigandanatha Buddha. When you are sitting and meditating, he is naked. But his Puna Nula, they are putting a thread here, so it appears like a robe. So when you are sitting, you can't set it out. But the, the Mahavira followers are not getting emotionally upset when they are publishing Buddha image. But they never recognize this as Mahavira's image. People recognize as the Buddha image, so they are released. But the Buddhist people get emotionally involved whenever they find the Buddha image is mis misuse. So, in just in the other side of the road, there is a Mahavira temple still running. Please visit it and see the Mahavira photos. Photos means images. They won't worry whether the Buddha image is put into the garden or water gardens or garden cities. They don't worry. We are the people worrying. So it is up to you to worry or not to worry. As far as you find something external, you are utterly end up with worries. If you find Buddha inside, no problem. So get the Buddha inside. When and where you become mindful, that's the highest respect to the Buddha. It has no time, no space. Whenever you find Buddha outside, that Buddha is subject to the Anichandukha Anatta. It's changing. Suffering and it's uncontrollable. So, therefore, whenever you find Buddha outside, you are the person, too. you are the sufferer. Even if you find Arahant outside, you have to suffer. Find inside. So, we uh, find many reasons to get worried. So, the Buddhism teach main thing is not to worry. Don't worry about the outside things. Those who are Believing Buddhism externally as a ism or religion, they will take care about that. We meditators must understand not to get involved in these kind of emotional things. If it is happening, consider it as a weakness. Consider it as a lack of experience, lack of insight, lack of mindfulness. And always, whenever such a uh, irritating thing happens, Check whether you are mindful. Can you see mindfully a Buddha under the water or in the water garden or in top of the highest place and paying respect? Whatever may be, it, it, it doesn't matter as far as if you are mindful.
If you are not mindful, wherever the Buddha may be, you are accumulating uh, karmic forces or accruing a wrong defilement. So therefore it is not the Buddha image outside. It's a matter of inside knowledge or uh, mindfulness within you. So much so you will get distance from the Buddha, specifically the image of the Buddha. The next question is, if it's not too much of a personal question, could you please let us know what led you to become a monk? Was it a single event or a gradual progression or a series of events? Sometimes I feel, I don't feel I am like a monk. I am spending exactly the same way. Of course my cloth is called robe, I am shaven. Oh, it's a natural process. So, to, on the other way, as far as you have taken this residential retreat, you have also been worth called monks, bhikkhu. To Buddha mention, the bhikkhu, the word meaning is sansari by dakhnaud, sansari by galavyunta katitukaran naud. Anyone who sees the, the sansari journey is fearful. Anyone who sees that is my prime importance to Get rid of that, that is the definition of a bhikkhu. So as far as you are in a um, residential retreat, you are a bhikkhu. So I can ask the person, how did you become a residential retreatant? Was it a gradual process or is it an immediate thing? I am putting the ball into your court. <laughs> That will be very interesting. Was it all of had happened all of a sudden? Or was it a gradual thing? It, it is not a job to come to a residential retreat. It is a serious decision. So exactly the same, like becoming a monk. Not that I am escaping from the question. I am putting the question in the more pragmatic way. Uh, if you are ready to answer, then I will come out with more information, not otherwise. Um, it was me who asked the question. <laughs> um, I think uh, it was a gradual progression. Um, I was always nervous about attending such a long retreat. Uh, this is my second three-day one. After the first uh, retreat, um, really enjoyed it. Um, I could see personal changes uh, as a result of the retreat. So um, I participated in the second one. So I would say it was a gradual um, progression for me. So still do you feel the same kind of attention or same kind of a novelty or do you feel when and where you come to the second, third, uh, it is not a big issue or not a big decision than the first one. That's correct, yeah. It wasn't uh, hard like the first one. So that is the thing very difficult to teach. Everyone, when they, whenever they are about to attend the retreat, they find negative things. They find it will be a very big change or a very big novelty. So therefore, uh, can't help. That's the nature. When you go for the second, third, and ultimately you find, why not? Why not go to the retreat line? So therefore, the Buddha mentioned, your first attending to the retreat must be in the early third of your life. When still you are young and the black hair, and then you, you, you go through this hurdle and understand it, then no, no, it's a free chance for you to go any time. It's just a phobia. It's just an emotional thing. So uh, put into yourself, into that, and ultimately you find before it is yes. Once you go to the retreat and see, it is not a big issue. So this is a, throughout the human life, human experience is like that. So becoming a monk and kind of thing appear like a very, very big issue, of course. So when I was with my teacher, Vinabhanyana Rama, 
we were both in a very relaxed mood, he told, if there is no monkhood in the life, in the world, what would, uh, what would have happened to people like us? We are not fitting into the society. If there is no order, we have to go and rest. We people are not entertaining the other things. So he himself told, if there is no sasana, if there is no monk's order, what can we do? We are outcasted people, black sheep. As the order is there, we, we, fit, we are well fit into that. And thanks to Buddha, he, he started this order. Otherwise, we can't start it. We are nowhere. So this is the world. So you may take the second decision also now. <laughs> the next question is, while growing up in Sri Lanka, I studied Buddhism for more than 10 years at school and at the Hampasala. The emphasis has been on rogue learning religious dogma. During this time, I never heard about uh, mindfulness. I, I came across this concept only recently in New Zealand. Why is mindfulness not a focus in mainstream Buddhism? Is it because it is too hard compared to rogue learning religious stanzas? No, I think mindfulness you can't make a commodity. Any other thing you can make a commodity and sell. The mindfulness you can make a uh, you can make a business venture. So anything if you have a commodity or the market value, it's catching, which is not having. For example, we have three kinds of food: solid the air solid and f the liquid so you see how much we pay respect to the solid foods we were, we do over time we leave our village and go to the other place and earn for this solid and now this pollution uh, the liquid also becomes somewhat and uh, sometimes it's a bottle of water it's more expensive than a bottle of milk in Sri Lanka. So water also becomes, but, but the most crucial thing is air. We never concern about that. Without food you can live seven months, without liquid you can live seven days, without wear you can live only seven minutes. So how much we pay respect? It's the most important thing. Or the breath. We never take single breath mindfully whole life. The disease the world, anything make commodity, you make stories, make fantasies, which you can't make a commodity, it may be the most important thing. We, he, he, historically it is not important, literally it is not important, we are not talking, we are talking utter nonsense, which is more trivial or more inner. We make books and books, formulas, but most important thing never. So that's why the Buddha says that uh, the uh, the Putujana world or the commoners world is tupsituri. They don't know the value. And they, they, they take <coughs> immense consideration and the emphasis to the trivial things. Leaving aside the most important thing because they won't make any economic value. Uh, the Buddha mentioned that the uh, Bhajanti sevanti chakaranatha, dukkha nikharana dullabha ajamitta, atthatta vanya suchi manusa eko chare kagga visana kappo. When we are associating and when we are acquainted with any, anything, we have agenda. Any association with any person or anything is because of our agenda. It is atthatta vanya, it is economy, it is rupees or dollars. Nothing but. Therefore, such people are just like shit. Better to live alone. Atattapanya asuchi manusa. Asuchi means shit. There's people with that uh, intention, the economic intentions, monetary intentions, utter dirty. So better not associate them 
just be live like a single horn of a rhinoceros eko chare kagga wisana kappo because a rhinoceros only have a single horn all the others have double the rhinoceros is the most powerful so they have to leave this bloody society was it is teaching utterly nonsense things and that means keep you occupied your most important thing is left behind at the death bed it's too late so therefore even in the buddhism that not only that now i am try to get this mindfulness to the schools mindful school the main problem from the buddhism buddhist are not happy this is don't bring that to our dham pasala <coughs> because then the new dham pasala will be a mess they can't teach their own subjects don't bring it to our temple our school because uh, there is no exams there is no diplomas nothing you can gain out of mindfulness so they push away uh, it's very interesting i myself as a born buddhist as a buddhist monk i have been for mindfulness for 30 years and when i am try to share with i can see the response and when you wait is go to the children when you it go to the catholic when you it go to the muslims they are highly appreciating this is one thing what a nice thing you are doing very good but i know you are not concern our concern is the buddhist 75% buddhist they are vehemently says no i feel so happy hilarious that thrill then feels because i am a born buddhist i am a born buddhist so when i go out retreats hardly i do meditation retreat in temples atmosphere is utterly negative when i go to a catholic church when i go to a retreat center very welcoming they are little expensive but if you wish to meditate this is the way so it is up to you don't find fault with the society society has given the variety of entertainment always select the better and when and where something become popular it is such shit that's a very clear way if you become not popular it's a kind of a healthy thing so see where the education is left now education directed to the popularity socialization education is nothing but socialization it is so western it's a very western regimentation presently education is to make you social so that means you you are going away from solitude you are going away from the contentment going away from the peace so still i thought of getting taking the education line to teach mindfulness that's why i we named it mindful school and we are going first to the education department and try to give it and there i can see the response i never get discouraged i never misled i never it is been a strange to me because for the whole 30 years i know the mindfulness is kind of a thing is not a the common man job so always minority always minority so let that be it doesn't matter and then we are you select it and if you know the strategy that is why venerable damik asked me it's australian man that was in 1979 when you are meditating don't let others know that you are meditating anyone can do only harm if you see do it in a secret way no harm is progress in like anything anything you find today problems in the meditation because you are bragging you are telling others i am meditating so much so you are in trouble not to me a midst of buddhist any society <coughs> any civilized person not do not happy uh, meditation as such because they think it is going against the civilization it's against the grain so therefore mindfulness is the tool mindfulness is the cutting edge so therefore uh, buddhism find very difficult to cater 
So recently one monk told me, maybe it is wrong, it is not bad to tell. People, those who are going Dhampasala, will never learn mindfulness. They are the worst lot to learn mindfulness. Instead, radical people, once given, they catch it. They, they, they jump and hug into that because mindfulness is asking for radical reflection. The Buddhism is make you a dull boy. Buddhism means that uh, the mainstream Buddhists, what, do you, what does it mean by the, this thing? So therefore, don't talk the subject in public. The next question is, what does karma mean? Karma, desire, or usually it's called sensuous desire. Spelling? K A R M A. Karma. Karma is deed. But in the Buddhism it says that uh, whenever you did something, whenever you did something, it takes time to mature. Once mature, its consequences come, karma and karma phala. And therefore when the consequences happen, you can't imagine from where does it comes. But it is coming from the karma, the action. But only the difference is, uh, the, when it is maturing, uh, hibernation time, uh, you can't see any consequences. So once the consequences happen, when the maturity happens, there is a gap and then karma and karma results going to happen. Otherwise the karma is just action. Or we can say karma means your volition. The next question is, how were the five precepts created? No, they, they are just like uh, social norms. Uh, during the time of the Buddha, it was a prevailing thing. There are a lot of suttas, other denominations also followers come to the Buddha and says we are also following the five precepts. So it is like uh, each and every country has its own constitution. Each and every has country has to money. And there are rules and regulations. So likewise, it's a basic uh, human uh, culture, five precepts. And uh, you find uh, each and every religion a little bit change change version of the same thing because uh, they should have a they should have a constitution for the uh, religious organizations to develop or religious growth spiritual growth to develop that uh, the basic something like uh, before the operation you have to disinfect without disinfection the operation is, the surgery is a very dangerous thing. So disinfection is very important before the surgery. The patient, the doctor, the theater, the equipments, medicine, everything must be disinfected. So precepts are just like uh, disinfection. Before the anesthesia, you have to disinfect. So it was not Buddhist as such, but the Buddhists are the only people preserved it undistorted. Other people got some distorted form and uh, Buddhist scriptures, as I mentioned earlier, number of suttas indicate during the time of the Buddha, the other people from the other denominations came and told Buddha, we also have the same five precepts, sometimes eight precepts also. Uh, Mahamaya, the Maya, the, um, the uh, Siddhartha, Prince Siddhartha's mother was under eight precepts the day she got the concept uh, uh, conceived. She was under eight precepts and they they had Sabbath day. That means one day they do, they eat half, don't eat the whole day. That is called Upavasa. That's called Uposata. That uh, precepts came into being and it's very, very ancient thing. Final written question is, what is the difference between a god and the Lord Buddha? No, that uh, Buddha is a human. The god is not human, celestial, and not verifiable. 
So we don't know whether she's imaginary or not. But the Buddha was a historical person. There are Indian archaeological uh, findings. There was a man. But the God, there are no archaeological, any sign. It is uh, not proven. Therefore, it may be a concept. But the Buddha was a reality. So this is one way of answering this question. This is more, I don't know if it'll apply to everyone in the room, but it's more personal question for work. So I guess you have highlighted and we all know that there's obviously health benefits coming from mindfulness. Um, and um, I guess the question is two part. Do you have experience in, personal experience in introducing meditation to I guess people with health problems and I guess the other thing is with that how would it best be and what time would it be best introduced to say patients with mental health problems or chronic pain issues and things like that would it be wise to to show them that mindfulness is is a good alternative to medication or um, things like that so each and everyone is a sick person mentally and physically. The whole world is full of sick people, not a single healthy person. So whoever learning mindfulness, whether taught by me or not, they are sick people mentally and physically. So I have nothing to say specific. Whoever I introduce, they are sick people, mentally sick, physically sick. And uh, mindfulness is not the only way to get out of sickness or healing effect or the therapeutic effect. But it's a very nice way of advertising. In Mahasi's system, there is a Dhamma therapy, a book published when they were, we are practicing Mahasi system, how much incurable disease they had and they recovered. And after that, they have written to Mahasi Sadhu and everything has been published. It's Dhamma therapy, and uh, whenever someone is meditating, they are explaining in terms of healing, physical and mental. So that is why easily you can reduce the meditation experience or meditation results to lack of frustration, lack of tension, <coughs> lack of mental diseases. Because it is both mental and physical, so whether you are mindful or not, easily you can understand if you are not mindful at all, you are in frustration. The whole generation. But mindfulness gives a split second, verifiable uh, experience when and where you are mindful, you can't have frustration. You can have tension. So that means it's a very easily one can put into practice. So, the, my association with uh, that kind of specific thing is nothing to highlight because each and every person is sick person. Not on the earth. Single healthy man. It says that Aho nirmana kaushalya yena lokang vinirmitak jagatyasmin suipule swastato naikopi labyate. After the Buddhism came into being, some uh, uh, sloka, the Sanskrit uh, poet, he mentioned, oh, what the kind of uh, creation of this world? Aho nirmana kaushalya. Yena lokan sunirmita. The whole world, they have prepared so much of vast area, plants and trees and human. Jagatyas means supule, such a big creation, not a single healthy person created. Therefore, the creator must be a sick man. You see? He would have created out of the whole gamut of human nature one single sick person, a single healthy person? No. So we are all in asylum. We are all in the 
hospitals. So therefore, mindfulness is yet another way, but nowadays in the West, people do mindfulness in the secular way only for healing and only for therapeutic. So therefore, huge amount of literature available. If you do one hour sitting, so much of results for heart attack, for diabetes, for cholesterol, for panic, for borderline, for schizophrenic. Schizophrenic is very less and results are available, but it is not a contributive thing that evidence is, that witness is not a big magical thing because the world is full of mad, mad people. So I'm one sir, is mindfulness is a part of the Buddhism or is it a totally different thing? Is it the Lord Buddha's teaching or is it something different to the Buddhism? Do you consider yourself as Buddhist or what, do you, what is your stand? Um, as you said, I'm born as a Buddhist. So Satipatthana Sutta. The Sati is the one mindfulness. So how do you see Satipatthana, what, how much significant in teaching of the Buddha? Satipatthana. How do you value it? It's an essential part of Buddhism or part and partial of Buddhism. It is the Buddhism. How do you feel? It is the essential part of the Buddhism. So that is the answer for your question. So, in that case, um, I came to know this uh, Lord Buddha's real Buddhism is in Saddhamma Pundarika Sutra. So, is that is that right or are we, are we learning on the different Buddhism than the uh, Lord Buddha's original teaching? No, Saddhamma Pundarika never considered as the original teaching. It's a definitely a fabrication later. But it's a very addressing to the present issue, addressing to the present day because it is written in more in contemporary time. The Theravada is considered the, the authentic Buddhism. The Dharma Pundarika issues and the seeds you can find in the Theravada, but this is very nicely presented. So therefore, people can come into the Buddhism from different, different ways. So, in my age also, when I was in university, I, I used to visit the art library, art faculty, and there one day I see who Pons sent teachings. So when I see the book, it was a very light book and written in the cyclostyle papers, and I was reading the whole book standing, and I found completely striking. Then only the, the interest started. So later that same group published all the uh, Mahayana books and published in the uh, conventional press and Buddhist publication societies and people had the fear whether these academic people leading the Kandyan people to Mahayana Buddhism. But it won't make much of a difference. Whatever may be, if you put into practice, you find you are in minority. That's a, that's, a, that's, a, that's a very proven fact. If you wish to be popularity, if you go for the, uh, the social trend, a very difficult view to be a practitioner. The mindfulness, mindful. When the mindful is uh, highly appreciating the solitude, highly appreciating the inter inner contentment, highly appreciating the peace of mind, rather than the sensuous gratification. So therefore, Mahayana as well as Theravada, uh, you have, it is the way, it is the, it is the place you are searching, or your natural selection, uh, is the, what, that should be blamable. If you find, uh, going to search in a wrong place, no, it is sure, because you are searching in a wrong place. Uh, the, the Buddha says, if you wish milk, uh, suck the breast, not the horn of the cow. Whatever the way you treat the horn of the cow, milk will never come. They have to suck it from the breast. So likewise, the Dhamma is there, that uh, those who have eyes can see. 
so to have ears can hear. But what you are uh, taken here now is uh, like a blind person and a deaf person because you are not searching mindfulness, you are not searching liberation, you are searching self sensuous gratification. So world is there. Is there another way of teaching yourself to be mindful? Number of ways, yes. Thing is the same. So just before coming in the in Melbourne, uh, we had a children program, and they are uh, we teach them how to do walking meditation with little demonstration, and then let them walk. And we teach them how to be sit and meditate, and ask them to do group sitting and then ask them to write their experience. It's a very, very uh, eye-opening way, enlightening way when the children put their experience. The one before the last, I gave uh, five topics and told, not the here and now, you go home, write projects overnight. One subject was, one topic I gave was mindfulness. Other one is be here and now. The other one is listening to the sound of silence. The other one is the, the glad game. How to be, well, you must try to find a reason to be glad under any circumstances. The other one knows SMS. Slowly, mindfully, silently. Each thing is con concerned about mindfulness but different ways. And when the children r written amazing the way they present how they come to know this sound of silence and how much it is contributed how they comes to know about slowly mindfully silently and how much they appreciating and recommending for others so I would say these are the different facets or different ways different teaching, te teaching techniques to introduce mindfulness to children could you tell us uh, um, one of the ways of teaching yourself to be mindful? SMS, slowly, mindfully, silently. When you're brushing your teeth, you know you do it yourself and you have allocated time and you may be doing it the same place and the same time. So when and where you wish to be mindful, do it very slowly or little slower than the normal, then your mind take special interest why I am doing slowly then you see because that slowliness is helpful you to be self-aware that be mindful slowly mindful and silently means listening to your own sounds when you are brushing how much unwanted noise you are making or how much silent you can do whenever you become you are listening to your own sound you are naturally mindful imagine when you are closing a door banging the door and you are disturbing you also get disturbed instead if you close the door in a, in a silent way you are naturally mindful and you understand still I can do it more slower and silently so that means you become self-aware or oh, same thing we can do one thing at a time and that done well don't do so much of thing at a time or for the sake of training at least, do one thing, brushing. And while brushing, don't try to talk, don't try to think, nothing, brushing. So it's a kind of way, that is the thing, Venerable Dhammika, when I'm complaining about, I'm a busy boy, I have no time to sit, I have no group, I have no other friend. So I, I, you ask him not me to not to expose it also. So what to do? He says, brush your teeth, mindfully. And now I am teaching, through that technique and I found there are a lot of other clips also other people also making the same issue how to be mindful how to be how to brush your teeth mindfully so it's a kind of a completely different way non-buddhistic way it's a secular way and everyone will understand it is helpful not only to be mindful when you are brushing mindfully you are really brushing your teeth not concerned about the past and the future and other kind of thing. So it's a one way.
can you also teach me another method mindfulness uh, maybe another method could be like making something like a cake make a cake like you're being mindful of what uh, you're putting into the cake and like what j- how much you need to put into the oven and stuff like that you happy like a girl <laughs> making cake I never thought about. Have you ever done? No. Oh. <laughs> that makes sense. Arey me 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 belle ka arey vena arey thattu karna me patra ekna the. Me kono thattu karna kaman na. ඔකේ සද්දයක් එනවා ඔය සද්දයක් යන පාත්‍රයේ යන සද්දේ ගහන්න බෑ නේ මොකද මම ඒක හරි නේ ඒක ඉන්න හා නෑ කියලා මේ වගේ නෑ නෑ බිම තියලා ගහන්න ඕනේ නැති ඔක තියෙන එක කරදී නෑ 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 දන්නවද අර රිංගින් බෝල් කියන එක නෑ මේකට තට්ටු කරන්න බෑ මේකට පෑන් එකෙන් තට්ටු කරන්න බෑ මේකට නව නව ඇම් ගෝයින් ටු ටීච් අනදර් මෙතන මේ මෙතන මේ මෙතන ඉන්න වාඩි නේද මේක අතර ගන්න සෝ වෙයිට් so we are going to close our eyes and listening to the sound you may hit once and now again the same thing listening to the end of the sound keep it very close there are some balls that uh, lingering and disappearing very slowly 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 and listening to the end of the sound naturally you become mindful so th- in this center they should have these balls computer ne- next again bring it to the yeah can bring it here and listen to the end of the sounds no you can keep it in here in the Uh, in front of the the mic yeah hit the 30 seconds 25 seconds 20 seconds 15 seconds 10 seconds still that sound is going 5 seconds and now wait Can you hear the end of the song? What is the experience of end of the song? So that was the very first thing we did last time in the, in Melbourne. What is what is the experience of end of the song? It's getting more I is starting to stop and then what is your hearing and listening your hearing experience and listening experience 
I'm hearing like I'm hearing this after the end you are hearing but not you are listening but not hearing your attention is completely to the sound but there is no sound so then what is you are hearing it's called sound of silence I'm hearing nothing at the end of the sound yeah. but I'm listening for the sound so you are not listening sorry not hearing anything but attentively listening okay likewise you are completely sleeping on a flat ground and look at the sky and you are utterly looking but not seeing nothing so then there is 100% looking but seeing nothing here 100% listening hearing nothing so imaging the body you living 100% but experience nothing so likewise the buddha says the i you are a eyed person and you behave like a blind person you are a eared person with a very good ear but behave like a deaf and you are a living person but living like a dead so under such circumstances whatever may be outside it won't inflict you so end of the sound indicate how to train your listening capacity when the sound is disappearing capacity is highly geared highly focused to listen even the pin drop sign sounds but ultimately it gives rise to nothingness but still you are attentively listening but hearing nothing so these are the points where we can introduce mindfulness to a completely in a secular way and you can try it again and again and imagine you have a pain in the leg and one day you see the disappearance of the pain after the disappearing that's what you call the the happiness when the end of the pain is a pleasure but we are not usually not experiencing it when the, the even the pain disappears we are worrying about another thing so that we are ne- we never entertain the end of the pain let us observe the end of the out breath observe the end of the falling face observe the end of the right leg at the beginning of the left leg and each and every start means something disappearing our world is usually geared to the starting point then the buddha says you are always giving a start to a suffering anything start is suffering instead same time there is a disappearing point focus the attention is disappearing that's the end of suffering so therefore whenever you mindful choiceless to be aware the so beginning of the sound sound and the disappearance and uh, you are happy to listen the beginning and the continuation but never go to the end of the sound moment you give the, the attention to the end of the sound it's a kind of a self awareness it's a kind of a mindfulness and ultimately you can uh, apply it to the anything what it may be a light it may be a sound it may be a smell a taste touch the disappearance is the same appearance is multifaceted many many sounds are there many many visions visuals of there but see the disappearance at whenever it is disappearing it's exactly make you mindful so how much we are unmindful in the, in the day to day because we are looking only at the beginning samudaya we never look at the why so but this is give the equal wait to the starting point as well as the disappearing point and see your bloody fool mind always searching for suffering the beginning part so much so you lose the bus you miss the bus so mindfulness give the the disappearing part whatever it may be and then you it it be it's a kind of way of introducing mindfulness and ultimately it's a way of it's live art 
it's art of living and don't worry about the rising thing they are taxing you they are they are torturing you understand each and every rising thing is disappearing without your influence and just look at the disappearance is not destructive it is not nihilistic it is not negative and that is the teaching of the buddha or they they are, we can say it is the mindfulness Pante, this is a question about that one called the GLAD game. Um, I'm not sure if I understood correctly, but I was thinking, like, isn't it unrealistic to teach children that you can be GLAD in any circumstance? Because we would all have, like, positive emotion, negative emotion, and, um, yeah, I just wonder if you can explain that a bit more. If you are not Pollyanna, which is very difficult. (laughs) If you are Pollyanna... That is the specific thing in the Pollyanna. The Pollyanna is a young girl, mother died, father is a Catholic father, very poor fellow, and uh, Pollyanna is telling my other peer friends, groups and others, they are playing with dolls, playthings. I need a doll. And father says, we get everything from the missionary bag and wait till the next missionary bag, there may be a doll. So when the missionary pair come, there was a crutcher. No door. So Pollyanna is crying, crying, you are just uh, waiting for me, asking me to wait, and they are, you, you told there may be, but it is not there, so how can I be? I am very sad. And that father is so moved, and he says, Pollyanna, can't you understand? The crutcher you need not for the moment, because your legs are not broken. Then it is a kind of a thing for Pollyanna. And later father died. And then she said to her auntie, very rich girl, consider Pollyanna as a shit. Unwanted girl. And she throughout the life, she played the game. Whenever you have a negative emotion, the disappearance of the negative emotion is a positive. Don't try to get it off. Let him let it disappear by itself. Mm. And ultimately, she is teaching the whole village. And lucky enough, yesterday, Janvir Hamdro downloaded the whole film. If we have time, it's from the BBC. I have the DVD from the Disneyland. It's a, it's a it's a useless. It's a kind of a commodity. But the BBC one is very nice. Look at it. And my teacher in Pandita Ramu Sayado. And the side he says that lady who has written the Pollyanna, Eline Porter, is called, should call Madam Metta. This is what you call Metta. Instead, see, see what we are doing like Metta Bhavana. This is not Metta. The Buddha says, see the love spots everywhere. See the reason to be glad everywhere. Then you are a happy person. But our whole family life, our whole education is fine to reason to be upset, worried. So we are masters. So that's why we end up with warriors. Warriors, not as a, <laughs> the samurais, but we are worrying from the morning to evening. Whole family is worrying. Not a single person even fight for glad game. They think this world is to worry. Nothing. It, it is. It is a mad person. If you know to have reason to be glad, every each and every event, there is a reason to be glad. There is a silver line on the each and every dark cloud. So look at only the silver line. Don't talk about the big dark cloud. Okay, now 
almost time up. Five minutes more. Four minutes more. I think um, Garth or my brother also wanted to ask this kind of question. I think with the teachings as life is suffering and things like that, and you're teaching mindfulness to children nowadays as well, and I think where does it... It can, it can easily fall into a trap where I think that, um, well, what's the purpose of achieving anything then in, in our, our world? You know, why do we not all become monks if life is suffering and, and things like that. So it's, it's hard to, because I think with success, so we can still make this world a better place. We can put our energy into achieving better things as lots of people are doing nowadays. So it's just, it's kind of hard to find that balance at the end. Well, it's kind of depressing when you know that it doesn't really mean anything at the end. Yeah, if you feel that for the last 200 years, science did a big contribution, everything ended up with suffering. Not a single ch change they have done. The only they did was they lost the moral shame and the moral fear from the human generation. That's what they did for the science. Now all scientists know it. That's what the real innovation we did. And we vehemently follow the whole human nature. What happens scientific nature? Go and see no moral shame, no moral fear. If that is the case, you need, that's the best example. But instead the contentment, instead the peace of mind, instead the solitude, completely lost. You are dependent now. You are dependent on this conspiracy theory. You are depending on the big economies. Or depend on the international companies. You're also talking for them. Yeah, but then, what would be the what would be the drive for a child at school to get a distinction versus a pass, or not even going to school? Do you know? At the end of the no, day, not not the, going to go into school. Do you know? That, uh, like, there's no drive. When I, mean, I for go them. to America, that Green Seals, that lady is a science teacher. She's teaching her 13-year and 4-year child at home. They are genius. The IQ level is maybe it's a born with. And she's so proud because whenever we go to the school, they are teaching bullshit. That's the education department, they are very well known. That you don't know, you may not be. If you wish, I will let you know. People never happy to tell that. Because they are regimenting, arm, conditioning mind. In the old ways, ultimately you become a slave. Become a slave of a big issue rather than you are becoming individual. You lose your individuality. But when you do mind, all this opposite, you are contented, you are happy. That means you will be very bright in education also. But I am an idiot person. And once I, when the mindfulness came into being, I went to postgraduate. I did a job with a foreigner, amazing, he says, the amount of capacity you are developing, what is the secret? Then I told, I don't know how to teach it. One thing at a time, and that done well. So therefore, the present day, the mass media, do you find any good thing in, that, in no. it? No. So then what you are talking about? No, but <laughs> you can be a full like a high, high level IT person. What do you do? What do you do? Well, that, that, well, that's what I'm trying to highlight. My point is being that if you already, when they people learn that, you know, being content with yourself and, and in the moment, well, then that is life essentially for them. So then, what, where's the drive they to improve also, human you society? You naturally never be mindful. It is also something to learn. We are using the same teaching techniques, but learning inward. Whole teaching is outward. Physics, chemistry, biology, any subject you name it, it's extrovert. You make it eccentric. But this is saying, without knowing your base, your home, 
whatever you may be, it's becoming a burden to you. So at least you must have a fair amount of understanding about the external world, extro, uh, the extrovert and introvert is to be, understand who am I. So therefore whole uh, religious quest this is to understand who am I. Without understanding who am I, whatever the world we are learning, without understanding the base or the pivotal point, what is it? So it can make very dramatic, it will be very attractive and uh, pulled for this knowledge. It's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's an addiction. That addiction now has gone beyond. That after the information technology came, any knowledge at the fingertip now. Not necessary to go to the school and the exams and kind of thing. It's a way, if you know the address, direct you can go there, any knowledge you can have. Early only we have the counting and all the kind of things. So therefore now knowledge, you can't control by knowledge. And still, if you do not know your own base, if you not, do not know who am I, if you do not know what is my personality traits, if you do not know what is my likings and disliking, anyone can manipulate you. So the Buddha says, no one can manipulate you, although your manipulation capacity reduces as far as you know, who am I? And present day education completely takes you out of that who am I question and you become busy, creativity, productivity and kind of thing. And they will give enough uh, credits and uh, diplomas and gifts and kind of thing. But that but will also do not know what is the who am I? And you also have no time. But when uh, utterly when you get a uh, cancer or AIDS or something like that, what will happen? Lost. Everything gone. If they will come and say you have a fast growing tumor in your brain, and then what has happened? Either you have to commit suicide or you have to hate. But in the meditation, we say yeah, we are vulnerable people. Anything can happen. So therefore the Buddha says if you develop mindfulness, you will get the highest benefit when you st when you are stricken with the incurable disease. Then you understand the value of mindfulness. Which you are with myself because you have been trained in. So therefore, mindfulness also a kind of a teaching. Because naturally you will not mi be mindful by natural selection. Someone has to introduce. It's the hardest thing to teach. So we are using all teaching techniques. But the only thing is direction is different. This is mm -hmm. inwardly. So it is called insight. In English they put insight for the Vipassana. So it's a very adventurous thing. If you take this as a challenge, how can I be mindful under multitasking situation, under uh, the demanding situation, and then only your brain is going to work. Your Neurobics are going to work, you have the capacity, but if you do, as far as you are not mobilizing it, they are, they are get corrupted. So the moment you have to understand, you find you are flourishing creativity coming, fl flourishing productivity coming. So Buddha is the highest person we call uh, the omniscient knowledge, not by PhD, not by Nobel Prize. They are all conditioning. So this is the one, make it, so take it as a challenge. A learned people, educated people can take mindfulness as a challenge, as a radical reflection and see, uh, not only understanding, not only inferential knowledge, put into practice, then you see your capacity. Simply you become human. Whatever the education you have, you will never be human. By explorer, exploiting others. You are becoming opportunist at the cost of others' health, at the cost of others' benefit. So therefore mindfulness is very innocent thing. You never exploit others. Instead you are exploring into your own mind and uh, that is also happening through education, happening through uh, teaching techniques. It is difficult, I, I agree, and it is not uh, everyone's job. Only very little fraction of people can get it whenever they are the potential 
become mature, uh, they can just give a try, but uh, never become a popular issue because it is it is uh, demanding so much of qualities, the patience, the the solitude, and the contentment. So these are not popular subjects for the moment. Okay, we are going to end the today's question and answer session, and we'll be. Uh, we are going to have about 25 minutes or so for the tea break, one hour for walking meditation, and then at 3.30 we are going to meet, uh, no, no tea break, but walking meditation. <laughs> Sorry. One hour walking meditation, but little less than one hour, and then we will be meeting here at 3.34 sitting meditation. Thank you very much for the participation. Thank mm -hmm. you.